Hello, everyone, and welcome to what I humbly consider to be a very unique episode of TFC because it is our first ever repeat guest that was so heavily requested, <laughs> and I will get to that guest in just a minute. But before I do, I want to say a quick hello to our beloved partners with whom we make every episode of The Financial Confessions. So as you guys know, we make every episode in partnership with Intuit, which is this amazing company that makes all of these financial products that have been, no joke, changing my life for, I think, literally seven years now. Because seven years ago, I first downloaded a free app called Mint, which I have used ever since to manage my personal my personal budget and is the first tool that I ever used to really take control of my money. But Intuit makes all kinds of products that help take every kind of financial decision and goal uh, and task in your life and make it so much easier and more intuitive uh, and something that really actually feels sort of nice to do because they have you know, beautiful interfaces and make nice pretty charts and give you notifications and all of the things that you need to basically have like a second brain in your back pocket that helps you manage your finances. And all of their products work beautifully together, QuickBooks, TurboTax, Turbo, Mint, to give you this really well-rounded and nice, beautiful way of taking care of your finances at every level. I have been using Intuit products for, like I said, like seven years now, and I could not recommend them more. So take a look at them at the link in our description or our show notes. So as promised, you guys wanted more Graham and you got more Graham. Graham Stephan hey. is back in our Hollywood <laughs> studio. Smash the like button for the YouTube algorithm. Smash that like button. <laughs> also, um, I have decided that your fans are named Teddy Grahams. Okay, okay. And the Teddy Grahams are numerous and you guys wanted him back on the channel. And when we threw it out to you guys that we we're gonna do like an AMA, um, you guys came through with, I think the most questions we've ever received for a prompt. So. Cool. We can't wait to dive into those questions and both answer them. But before we do, for those who may not be familiar, Graham, you want to give a little info about yourself? Yeah. Um, yeah. My name is Graham Stefan. I started as a real estate agent, then turned somewhat real estate investor, then somewhat YouTuber and personal finance enthusiast is what I've been calling it. So, nice. Yeah. So that, and that's me. You are known yeah. uh, in some circles for saving about 99% of your income. Yeah. Which is so cool. Um, and we'll get into more of all of that later, but I figured we would just dive right into some of our favorite questions that cool. you threw out to us. Looking forward to it. And we will not be able to get to them all, but we'll do our all best. All right, so let's do it. All right, so let's start with one of the ones that you really liked. Uh, does Graham celebrate holidays? And if so, does he buy gifts? Yeah, so I do celebrate holidays. Like, who doesn't celebrate holidays? But yeah, that should not be a yeah. part of your financial plan. No, um, <laughs> but uh, I would say like the major holidays Absolutely. Like New Year's, uh, Christmas, Halloween's one of my favorite holidays. Like so, yeah. stuff like that. Some of the three day weekends, admittedly, you know, those to me are really another work day. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's, it's a good excuse to get out of town on a long weekend and just use that as like, hey, you know, you may as well just leave, you know, go to, go to Las Vegas for a few days, something like this. Uh, and of course, you know, do I do gifts? Yes, I, I do gifts. What do you like? Do, just do, do, do like a very specific budget for the gifts? I don't really have much of a budget. Like my thing is usually I, I don't really ever want gifts because I feel like if there's something I really want, I would I would just go and get it. So I usually tell people, if you're going to get me something, just go and get something for yourself. You don't need to give me anything. Uh, and then for myself, there's never really any budget. It's just whatever kind of comes up around the holidays that I feel like might be of good use, you know, within reason, like obviously I'm right. thousands of dollars, uh, but within, you know, the, the few hundred range usually. Nice. This is pretty reasonable. I feel like it might be a generational thing. Like, I feel like our parents' generation is, like, way more into a lot of gifts than mm. our generation might be. Like, I, th I don't know. That's just – Ryan's nodding. I feel like I've got some backup here. Like, my parents on Christmas, like, they just love – the tree with just like overflowing with gifts yeah. under it. And I understand the magic that that is, but I also always feel, I kind of feel like you. I'm like, I don't, I, I have everything I need. Yeah. You know, All but right. I do like giving a gift within reason. Mm -hmm. All right. So what's another Graham pick? We have question 15 on our list and shout out to our social media manager who always organizes these so nicely. Um, since Graham is a homebody, why not move to an area with a lower cost of living? Wow. That is a really good question and that's popped into my mind so many times just like moving to uh, honestly nevada would be the only place if i were to really? move anywhere where yeah, in nevada it's close by i feel to la to california 
and 0% state income tax, mm. which would, for me, it would at least just be the only reason to move, would just be for tax purposes. Um, the only reason why I have not done that yet is really because my entire life is here in LA. Like, all of my friends are here, my family is here. I, I like living here. And I'm afraid if I just picked up and moved, would I be miserable somewhere else? And would that impact the work I do if I was not as you know creative or motivated or really enjoyed where I live? Uh, so for me, at least right now, I kind of see that Los Angeles, I'll pay way more to live here. Uh, but that gives me just, I guess, that support system right now that I think is really important. Nice. I live in probably one of the highest, not the highest, but like it's got to be a Manhattan's got to be amongst the right. highest uh, tax, and we're also in, in, incorporated there. Uh, and I only, if I were to ever move somewhere, move somewhere with higher taxes. So higher taxes. Well, France. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we got it. We got it the thumbnail. The YouTube reaction. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, no. Uh, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna get one that was all primarily right. to me, but cool. you can also absolutely answer it. Oh, this is a good one. Is there such a thing as too much diversity in your investments? I would say my answer to that, I think because everyone knows that like I'm very, I'm just like an extremely risk averse person when it comes to investments. Uh, so I'm assuming by extremely diverse, they're probably talking about like having just like funds uh, and just like a, basically as diverse as you can get in that regard. I would say it's almost never going to be an issue to have things too diversified. The only thing that I would say is that you may not be doing enough focusing on the more medium term versus long term investments. Um, and you want to make sure that each of your investments is really serving a purpose. Um, because obviously the way you might invest for something that you could theoretically take out in 10 years is going to be different from something that you would take out at retirement. But I feel like I, I would rarely say that too much diversity is the problem. Usually the problem is that there's not enough of it. But again, I'm like an extremely, I invest in the most like safe and diversified possible way, I would say. What about you? I, I know you're a little that. bit more risky. I, no, I agree with you. I really think there's, there's not such a thing as too much diversity when it right. comes to your investments. My only issue would just be, are you playing it too safe? Like if you're 20 years old and you're only investing, you know. I'm if playing it too safe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but if, you're, if you're going crazier in like bonds or like, you know, savings accounts or really like, really like super risk adverse investments and mm -hmm. you're young, then maybe you could probably afford to take on more risk, but overall, I don't think too much. Diver but but then again, just the question alone, too much diversity would almost lend itself to thinking that you're going like really risky and really safe at the same time. So maybe just diversity in itself. Yeah, means that question's you'll a little vague. Yeah. yeah, but I will say, well, so to your point, if you are including things like a high yield savings account and you've got a whole bunch of money in that, definitely don't do that. Um, but in terms of like. Yeah, if you're having a broad basket of longer term investments, I think that's generally the way to go. Usually the mistake that people will be making is to put a lot of money in something like a single stock, mm -hmm. um, which is you Tesla. Know. Do you have money in Tesla? I do. Did you see my video? No, wait, tell oh, me about it. Oh, wow. So what I, happened? So I invested, so when I bought the car, the Tesla Model 3, I figured I would just throw some money in Tesla stock mm. to, in, in my mind, it was like, oh, if this pays for the sales, you know, sales tax of the car, I'd be right. super happy. And I bought in at 260, and then it went down to one, like 76 or whatever. And I was super bummed, uh, you know, about that. But I, I invested in an amount where basically if it went to zero, I wouldn't really care. Uh, Is this pre or post SEC? S, what? what? They're the fine. Oh, oh, no, this was uh, almost a year ago. Okay. Yeah. Um, so my video the other day was that I sold the stock at 9, God, what was it, 912, I think. Whoa. Yeah, Yeah, because it was just, it was stupid how much it was going up. And I figured like at this, because my intention was to hold Tesla for mm. a very long time. I mm. never buy individual stocks. This is the only one because I got the car and I kind of believed in it. Yeah. But when I saw it run up like that, I'm like... Now, I would be stupid not to take profits at this point. So I did. Yeah. yeah. Well, listen, that's like the... So I always say that like buying individual stocks is really not all that different from going to Vegas. And you did yeah. the exact smartest thing someone can do in Vegas is that when you have a bunch of winnings, yeah. leave the table. Yeah. Um, don't stick around. Uh, but I will say also, I think it's a good point that I... I'm very similar to you in that if I ever do buy an individual stock, it's because I support the company for some reason outside of what could potentially be my financial, you know, health. It's it's literally I, I either support their mission or I am a participant in their product and want them to thrive. Or like you have to have some reason to do it because it's really not a super sound strategy. I agree. If people could tell which stock was going to perform and which wasn't. I know. And that was luck, by the way, for me selling at that price. Totally. I mean, I, yeah. What is it at now? Uh, I think like 750 I mean, it dropped like 20%. 
oh my after God. I had sold it. But everyone is saying, like, Graham, you knew. You're so smart. But honestly, that the tables would be turned. I mean, it could have it just as easily gone up to 1,000, and everyone would be like, Graham, you're so stupid. You're so dumb. I can't believe. You know, so it's just it's luck at that point. I'll admit Look that. Look at you. Yeah. Graham, have you ever done something reckless with your money? Oh, man. <laughs> uh, not really. I am so careful about money. Reckless with money. Um. I bet five hundred dollars on the Super Bowl and I lost this year? that. Yeah, lost that one. They were <laughs> supposed to win. Um, uh, I mean, oh no. that's that's <laughs> that was pretty bad. Um, really reckless. So not. I am so I'm so careful with everything that I do, and everything is right now has worked out so favorably. Um, I I oh you know what I guess the most reckless thing I did I threw like three grand into uh, a cryptocurrency two years ago. It's called Ryblox. And I bought in, I think it was like $1.60 or $2 a, a coin, if you want to call it. It went all the way up to like 40 something dollars a coin. And I was sitting on some like really amazing profit on that. And I didn't sell it. Oh, no. And it yeah. went down. It, it, it was supposed to be listed on this exchange called Binance. And I was like, it's going to go to like $45, $50. And my plan was like sell it as it approaches 50 But it just, it never did. And it started going down. Like, it's going to go back up. It's going to go back up. And it now it's worth like, I think like so now I'm like I've lost money on that oh no I know. listen I mean yeah. you kind of get what you know what you're getting into with coins I mean yeah but still um do you believe and I we should both answer this one right. but I'll let you go first okay. do you believe that work is a means to fulfillment or just to wealth oh man um I think you could go both ways on that I think there's for some people, I, I I don't even know how, how to answer that. I, I think it's so personalized to the person. Mm. I think for a certain percentage of the population out there, your work can be a means for fulfillment. And I think mm. if you really love what you do and you're pat- and you and you found a way to make money doing that, then absolutely. But I think for the majority of people out there, work is just a means to an end. It's just something you got to do to get what you want. And maybe they're not totally passionate about what they're into or really enthusiastic about. I think it can be, but I think, unfortunately, the majority of situations out there are not the case. You know, I very much agree with that. I feel like what's frustrating for a lot of people is that a lot of times the people who are giving advice about things like work, fulfillment, et cetera, are often people who are in really cool jobs or like people who really do what they love or people who have the luxury of working a job that extremely aligns with what they want to be doing every day, which to your point is not the case for most people. I would say, I mean, for me, obviously there's an an element of fulfillment to it, but ultimately, ultimately at the end of the day, I think people often, it's, it's the worst outcome for people when they treat their job, especially when it's just, you know, they're working for an employer and they treat it as if they, like it should be, um, that it should be everything to them. Like their work is their family and their job is their love. Like I think that often for a lot of people creates really unhealthy boundaries between work and life where you'll find yourself like sending emails at 11 p.m. or like checking it first thing in the morning on a Sunday and it just creeps into the rest of your life. And I think you always have to remember that at the end of the day, work should enable you. It should enable you to do things you love, but it should also enable you to live a good life. And if you find yourself letting work overwhelm the rest of your life, that's time you can't get back, in my opinion. Yeah. Now, if you are someone like, you know, Grammar myself and you own your own business and, you know, that's something that you absolutely love doing, sure. But, you know, I know a lot of people who are, I would say, a little bit too dedicated to their work and it, it creeps into their life. But if they're too dedicated, couldn't that be their sense of fulfillment? It could be. I think for some people it is. But I do think like a lot of our audience will say they feel like a little bit like workaholics. Mm -hmm. Like they just don't know how to put up that good boundary. Yeah. And I feel like that's why I feel like it's important to have at least one thing outside of your job that you really care about. I agree A hobby, an activity, something else that balances out. Because if it's just work and going to sleep and watching TV, it's not healthy. I agree. How do you deal with the anxiety and pressures of YouTube to come up with new ideas? Still trying to figure that one out. Um... (laughs) In terms of coming up with ideas, I drive myself crazy. So, I oh, mean, really? my, yeah, oh, geez. So, my process of, of coming up with video topics, I watch so much YouTube. Nice. I mean, I probably spend two hours a day watching YouTube videos, and that's all my downtime. Like, if I'm not 
do, like even as I'm making breakfast, like the eggs are cooking on the skillet, and I'm sitting there like scrolling, like who's posting what, um, you know. And then I watch all my videos at uh, two times speed, so that way I can try to get through videos faster and like absorb. I do one point five. One point five, yeah. Find a healthy balance there. Um, <laughs> but I see what other people are posting, any trending topics that come up. I read so many websites too, like CNN, CNBC, anything on Reddit, uh, any financial blogs. I read so much. Really, until the point where just all of a sudden you get this this whiff of inspiration. Let's say, like I'll read a topic. Sometimes I'll be like, "Oh, this is so cool," or I'll see something that that is trending or something a lot of people are talking about in financial. I'm like, "Oh, I want to give my insights on this," and that's typically my favorite. Is like anything newsworthy, right? Where something happens with like a credit card, and I can comment on it. Like those are my favorite videos right now to do. Is like just my commentary over a subject. Less right now how tos. I think yeah. I started doing like a lot of like how to make a hundred dollars a day, how to make, you know, you know, ten thousand, how to invest. Um, I I've just kind of grown a little bit bored of that. So yeah. commentary stuff for me. But uh, it's it's a grind and there are certainly days where I just don't have any motivation or just there's there's nothing there. And I'm like, well, I gotta get a video out today. So I have a backlog of just ideas that I've that I've come up with in the past that I know are gonna do well that maybe I'm not totally into, but you know, I know people will enjoy them. So I just I just chug through and I just I just do it anyway. I would say that that is probably a more profitable and viable and strong growth strategy because being responsive and being timely on YouTube is hugely works in your benefit as yeah. a channel. It just is. We have always made a conscious choice at TFD to not be timely at all. Like we literally make all of our videos like two months ahead of time. We have no idea. Like we don't respond to anything and we don't know what's going on. Like when the video comes out, we have no idea what the news will be. Um, which does put us at a disadvantage sometimes. It just does. Like yeah. I literally recently on a video commented on the Tati Westbrook, James Charles thing that happened a year oh ago. Oh my God, you can't do that. Uh, yeah. No, I mean, very neutrally, but you know, just basically I spoke about the issue, but suffice to say it happened a straight up year after that thing happened, which is not how the YouTube ecosystem and algorithm works. So that has just been a conscious choice. And I will say, I think that it leads us to miss out on some things and it leads for our growth to be less sharp than it could be. Um, and for us to go viral less than we could go. But I think in terms of, for me, balancing sustainability, it's it's been a good option for us. Uh, but that being said, I'm not totally closed off to the possibility of one day getting a little bit more into the, the mm -hmm. commentary space. Oh, yeah. For me, it's definitely like you have to upload within hours. Yeah. Like when the whole Tesla situation happened, I sold my stock that morning and then uh, seven hours later I had a video out about it. So like some of those things, you, you have to be on it, otherwise someone else will. And I took pride, by the way, in that I was one of the first people to comment about that and like it, and really put a lot of time into this. So sometimes with YouTube, in terms of a growth strategy, you have to be the first to comment on it. Because by the time three other people talk about it, it's like it's old news. You have to just be like, you know, on it. Yeah, we're. I don't think I've ever done that. That's that's what it's I so, use Twitter oh for. No, it's, it's so much fun though when you get the pressure, of just like I gotta get this out. This is like you know, and, and this is like this challenge, like this race. So like I gotta get this video out first. Do you edit your own videos? I do. I do okay. everything myself. See, I don't yeah. do that, that at all. So I like I would I would have to really. I'm like, yeah. could you imagine? I get our editor. I'm like Emily, get this up now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, my editing would be so much better if I hired a professional. But no, I do it all myself. All I'm. That's nice to have so. control though. Oh yeah. This one's interesting. This one's kind of saucy. Have you ever been told you don't deserve what you have and how did you respond? Don't deserve what I have. I'm assuming I've, they're referring to like being, you know, a millionaire. Oh, I've, I've just never been, uh, that, that's just never been a thing that's, that's come up for me, I guess. I've been told, I mean, not that I don't deserve what I have, but I think uh, I've, I've, I've encountered um, people who... Because to be honest, like what is successful in media is kind of luck of the draw to a large extent in terms of like we got picked up by the algorithm on YouTube one day in like 2016. I disagree though. I don't, th I don't think it's just luck. It's not or just it's, luck. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, no, yeah. consistency, right. putting out a good product, like but all I, of those things are I important. Know. See, I believe there's a strategy behind it. And as yeah. long as you could dedicate yourself to the strategy, you that will lend itself to be picked up by an algorithm. I think beyond a certain extent, I think there is an element of, of, of I don't want to say favoritism, but I do believe 
beyond a certain point, there's a bit of just, you know, some channels are favored more than others. But until that, I think there's definitely a strategy you can follow and just, and some of that, by the way, is just you got to drop everything when a trending topic comes up, like you got to do it. You got to be the first to, to be on it. Well, I can only say yeah. from our experience that there was zero strategy involved in getting on the homepage. We literally did not know what was happening for the first three hours. We were like, mm -hmm. why are our metrics going crazy? Like our analytics are frozen because they're so yeah. extreme. And we, we did learn that that, we later learned the dynamics behind what led yeah. that video to be on what the homepage. What video is that? I think it was the things that I cut from my budget and don't miss at all. I'm pretty sure that was the video. I, I'd have to go back and look. Yeah. There were a couple that were on various trending things and one was on the homepage and I think it was that one. Mm -hmm. um, and to be fair, like we did learn from that and we leaned into that experience and made you know some choices that would kind of recreate it. But I do think when I've heard like, not you don't deserve, but like people yeah. being like salty, it's about like, you know, why is your, why are you getting this and, and another person isn't? And the truth is that like, yes, some of that can be strategy. Um, but sometimes it, it it's just a question of putting yourself in the right place yeah. at the right time. I feel like that's a terrible mindset though, to think that like, you don't deserve this or you did this. Cause, cause otherwise you, you, I, I feel like that almost puts yourself in just a, a a vulnerable and victim mentality. That, yeah. that you're focusing more on someone else's accomplishment than you are on yourself. And I think just <laughs> the element of focusing on someone else and trying to put them down or let's say, um, what's, the, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, diminish, let's say, their accomplishments. Crabs in a bucket. What, what is it? Crabs in a bucket. Never heard it's of like that. Yeah. a bunch of crabs are in a bucket and one starts crawling out and the other one like pulls the oh, crab down to help yeah. himself get out, but it just pulls them both down. Oh, that, that, see, there you go. I feel like people can get a lot further if they focus more on themselves than other people, if that makes sense. Yeah, ne negatively, I, I, th I think you could look for other people as for inspiration, uh, but not in terms of just, hey, they shouldn't have that, you know? Yeah. But I, that's been, I feel like that's important for everyone. Like I definitely like, listen, we all probably look at other people in any career field and say, wow, I would love to have that someday. But you have to learn to like, one thing that I have found is extremely cool as a strategy is anytime I've like seen someone who I really admire and I'm liking what they're doing and it could easily turn to like envy or resentment or whatever I reach out to that person and I say I'd love to do something with you yeah. um, or at the very least I love what you're doing mm -hmm. and it sort of like diffuses it and now that maybe that person could end up being a collaborator cool you got to squelch those feelings they're not healthy all right <clears throat> what differences in opinions do you two have on money it's capitalism. <laughs> right? Oh my god! <laughs> True. <Yeah. laughs> oh my god. Taxes. Taxes. Um, yeah. Well, elaborate. <laughs> I'm. I see. I'm a firm believer that you know, if if, if you want money, you, you just got to go out and work for it. I'm a firm believer that uh, you know, well, not in all situations, but I think in in some, I th you know, I would be in favor of, of slightly lower taxes. You know, for certain things, um, in terms of just a free market, uh, being able to go and you know, if there's demand for something out there or a problem, you could solve it and capitalize on that. And uh, you know, that, those things to me are, are important. Raise my taxes. I would love to pay more. Um, love, love uh, social programs. Love the government. <laughs> this is one of the biggest misconceptions that I feel like is so important to clear up. Like, even if you look at like a country like. Finland. I don't know. Any of these countries that have like really robust social programs, they're also fundamentally capitalist countries. Like they have a free market. They they don't uh, like so that's a that's kind of a misconception. I I clearly don't hate capitalism. I have a, a small business, but I do I, I I definitely think there's a there could be a stronger role of the of the social safety net and I love to participate in it. I actually enjoy paying taxes. I get a little thrill out of it. You do. I love it. I, it makes me, it feels like a privilege to me because it means that you're doing well enough that you can give to others. That's kind of how I look at it. Now, uh, does that mean I necessarily love every single thing that my tax dollars go to? No, but overall it's better than the alternative, which is that you're not making enough money to be able to pay them, which used to be the case for our small business. So, mm. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, some places where taxes go, I, I totally agree. It's, it's a necessary thing. You yeah. got to do it. Um, I wish... And we could just go in. This is totally another video on this. It's maybe some of the tax dollars went to better, better programs and better uses. Yeah, I think there's um, that. That's yeah. true for sure. I would so. also say a big difference philosophically is I think that you feel that the individual has a stronger 
possibility of financial agency than maybe I do. And I think I think there's a lot of people like I, I'm very interested in like, for example, the cycle of poverty and how difficult that can be for a lot of people to get out of. And I think um, I think what I always want to do is balance out what I think is like, obviously we do give financial advice. There is an, a large extent to which I think people are capable of helping themselves and of making better decisions. But I don't think, I don't think for example, that everyone could, could become rich. I don't know. I really want to believe that anyone can be rich because I, I think just even having that optimism that anything is possible certainly gets you a lot farther than believing that I can't do it. Yes, I, where, where I'll say that I do agree is that I think anyone, that it's important to keep the belief that you could have a better situation than you currently do. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's important to keep in all elements of life, not just the financial. I agree. Um, being defeatist doesn't help anyone. Ooh, huh, salty. How do you both feel about luxury goods as an investment such as Graham's watch? <laughs> how do you feel about my watch? <laughs> so tell everyone how much your watch costs. Uh, this is a different one today. Oh, no. Well, tell them how much the fancy watch costs. Uh, yeah, the fancy one was uh, about 20 grand. Um, yeah. Here's the thing. Unlike uh, many financial, like fi personal finance people, I think that's fine. I think that everyone, what I'm mostly concerned about is two things. Can you afford it? And does it genuinely bring you joy um, and fulfillment? And it's meaningful in your life. I think there are a lot of people who buy designer and luxury goods because they want to be perceived in a certain way. Mm -hmm. uh, and they either do that without it really giving them much value or they can't really afford it. And I think that's pretty much universally bad. But if something is genuinely of real value and meaning to you, uh, and it's something you're going to get a ton of use out of every day or you know very often, uh, I think you're fully entitled to make that choice. I totally agree with you on that one. I think another component of that is that a lot of, not all, but some luxury goods keep their value really well. That's true. Um, Rolex watches, for instance, some of them, you know, should keep pace with inflation. There's some watches out there, like a Rolex Daytona. Like, you can get a stainless steel. Let's say you get it for twelve grand. Chances are it's going to keep its value, if not go up in value, maybe 5% a year or so. Yeah. Um, not all watches, but there are a lot of things that you can get that are basically the equivalent of a savings account. Same with certain cars. A uh, Ford GT would be a perfect example. For three hundred grand, you can have this amazing exotic car, uh, and then be able to drive it for years and sell it for the same price, if not more, than what you paid for it. So there's certain cars and certain things out there you could certainly do well with. Uh, Hermes bags, I think, are, are another yeah. one. I don't know much about those, but I hear they're pretty good. Yeah, and but the thing is that like it also just depends on what is going to really add value to your day to day life. Like I would never personally buy like a luxury purse, for example, just because I wouldn't it wouldn't really make a difference in my life. But like I have a lot of kitchen things that are very high end. Like I have Wusthof knives, I use stove cookware. Like I use a lot of things that like on their ticket price are incredibly expensive, but I cook constantly and mm. they really improve my experience of cooking every day. Every time I slice with that knife, a little shiver of joy runs down my spine. Nice. And shitty knives are dangerous because you have to bear down too hard and you can cut yourself. How many bank accounts do both of you have? I don't even know. Do you want me to count? Sure. Okay. Hold on. I got to. Are we counting? Let's count credit cards too as a bank account. Okay. Just to like really give the full spectrum. And we can, we can count investment accounts too. Uh, from what I see here, eight and that includes bank what? accounts. Just bank accounts. Th that's bank accounts. Yeah. Just a bunch of different savings goals. Eight, eight different banks. Um, Whoa. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, some of the issue was that um, uh, I'm over the FDIC limit because I just I save everything. So you you know I try only to keep two fifty per bank, um, and I didn't want to be too concentrated within one place. But also, I've, I've opened up bank accounts to get better mortgage rates. Like, mm. I opened up a, a one recently to get a you know better better interest rate on that. Um, and then other banks, like Ally is a big one that I have, like, multiple different checking accounts with, with Ally. Uh, but otherwise, like, I basically just tried a whole bunch of bank accounts. Same thing, with, like, because I make a lot of videos about, like, what's the best high-interest savings account. So for me to do that, typically I'll go and open up the bank account, go and use it, and that way I have a first-hand experience if I go and talk about it. What about uh, credit cards? How many do you have? Over 10, 11, 12, some, something like that. Jeez. I honestly, I don't even know at this point. Uh, several are business cards, a lot of personal. I, I wouldn't even know. I, I don't even have them on me. Yeah, I'll, yeah. Go th I'll, I'll go through it. I have to think about it. But yeah. okay, so obviously investment, retirement, all that is separate. So we'll leave that out. But several of those. Um, uh, I have 
my checking account, my savings account, our joint accounts, both checking and savings, uh, all at the same bank. Uh, and then I have, at a different bank, I have business checking, business savings. Um, and I think that's it. Uh, so yeah, about like seven, six, seven total that I use on like a pretty mm. much daily basis. And then credit cards, uh, three, three personal of one business. Yeah. yeah. You get more, get some more credit cards. Yeah. Get I could get more, more credit points. cards. Yeah. We're actually thinking of changing, uh, Amex recently switched around all of their benefits with Delta. Uh, cause like I basically like the vast majority of what I use my credit card for, uh, cause I fly all the time. Mm-hmm. It's just like miles, um, and points. Yeah. Uh, I also use the Chase Sapphire. Um, so just like a lot of that. So we're always just like keeping up on like, what are the benefits? Can we get a better, you know, you should always be making those cards work and you can totally call your card company. You can negotiate things like, cause you always want to make sure that the benefits that you signed up for with that card are holding in place. And Agreed. sometimes they change. Agreed. Yeah. Chase Sapphire reserve. We're looking at you. Yeah, we are. Also, the Amex Change Gold. Yeah. Um, all right. A lot of bank accounts. Uh, how? Ooh, this is good. How much money would you feel you need to be satisfied with and not feel like you need any more? I mean, my goal has been, I, I don't, I really don't even have a goal, but kind of like 10 million was, was the number where I felt like ooh, that would be just and a cool number to net hit. Net worth? Net worth. Okay. Um, so that includes like your properties. And your yeah. Property. I don't know though, because even at ten, then you, then you'll look at people with twenty, and at twenty you'll look at people with forty. I don't think there's ever an amount that you would that you would necessarily feel content with. I think you could you could really feel that with almost any amount, as long as you have enough to cover your expenses. Um, so I mean, that's my answer. Is just I, I think just we as people always want to be progressing and doing more, um, and, and seeing progress in what we do. So I don't think there's ever going to be a number where like you hit that and you're like, okay, I'm done. I feel like there's always going to be something a little bit more that you can do and you know work on yeah um i feel like i have enough money now i don't need any more like when we gave our like the partners were talking about raises at the end of last year and like i could have given myself a bigger raise other people got i didn't take it because i was like i'm fine like i i'm saving enough i'm like on pace with all my goals i love where i live i love my lifestyle so I, i'm good i'll take the raise yeah no I, <laughs> i'm good to me you should buy you should buy some luxury goods. <laughs> That's no, it. I buy the Rolex. No, but yeah. I would no. <laughs> no, but I, but in all in all honesty, it's not just like for totally like altruistic purposes. It's also that like at this point, and I'm sure you can relate to this. Like I'm, I would rather keep more money in the company. Yeah. Like I Fair like enough. the safest. I feel the best. I feel is when TFD has a huge emergency fund and a great line of credit. Totally agree with that. So that's the most important to me. Cool. Now, Graham and I talked a lot about taxes in this first half, Uh but no matter how you stand on them, you're going to need to pay them, and you're going to want the right tools to do it. I know that taxes are probably not your favorite subject, even though I love them as I keep going off about in this show. Uh, But no matter how you feel about taxes, they're going to be something that you have to do. And what is most important in doing your taxes is making sure that you're doing them correctly and that you're getting the maximum possible refund that you're entitled to. It can feel sometimes really, frankly, overwhelming to do taxes by yourself, and you don't always necessarily know if you're doing it right. You don't always know the answers to the different questions you're being asked. So I highly recommend a product like TurboTax, made by Intuit, that will help walk you through the process, ensure that you're doing everything the way you're supposed to be doing, that you're reporting all of your various income correctly, that you're doing the right deductions, that you're basically just doing everything cleanly and well, and ensure that at the end you're getting the maximum possible refund that you're entitled to. What you want more than anything when you do your taxes is peace of mind, and that is exactly what TurboTax offers. So I highly recommend you check them out. I have used TurboTax myself several times to great success. Uh, So find out more about TurboTax at the link in our description or our show notes. Ooh, this is a good one. Uh, How much did you, Chelsea, and would you, Graham, pay for your wedding? I'm happy to share. Yeah, you go first. Uh, So I don't know the exact total off of my head, but I will give you the total breakdown of how we paid for everything and what money we received and what was out of pocket. So we had a bit of a unique situation because we uh, were from two different countries. So it was not realistic for us to have some like big wedding uh, with everyone that we know in our lives. So we had a fairly reduced number of people. We were 27 
at our wedding. Um, and we had it in France near where his family lives, which meant that like half the attendees had to come over from the States. So our goal was to pay for a villa for everyone to stay for the week and cover all of their food, uh, you know, the, the actual ceremony, all that reception, everything, um, so that they would only have to fly themselves out, which is already quite a su substantial expense, but so they would have to fly themselves out, but that was it. Um, and we did no gifts and everything. Uh, so the villa, which we did pay out of pocket, uh, for the week. I believe it was somewhere around six thousand to seven thousand um, dollars, but that obviously is lodging for almost thirty people. Uh, we had a pool, we had a bocce ball court, like it was fantastic, cool. and everyone got to stay for free. Um, I think on top of that, auxiliary expenses. We probably because we paid for a couple people's plane tickets, we paid for uh, a few things here and there, rental cars, all that. I think we additionally maybe paid a couple grants. So we we came close to paying about, and a lot of the meal we we put toward. I think we paid about maybe ten to twelve thousand dollars out of our own pockets total. Uh, after that, each of our parents contributed five thousand dollars, which went to various things like a rehearsal dinner, uh, the actual ceremony itself, the reception, some of the auxiliary expenses. Um, and uh, we, of course, uh, also had the food that was at the villa and Mark's, uh, my husband's um, family, they're uh, farmers. So they had a lot of food and they also were part of a wine uh, co-op. So they brought a ton of wines. So we had a lot of freebies on the food and drinks, which really offset the cost, which was awesome and such a luxury. Uh, but so suffice to say, long story short, about 30 people in a villa for a week with all the various ceremonies. Uh, we out of pocket paid around 10 grand, I think, and our parents uh, paid, contributed between the four, uh, 10,000. Hmm. So about 20 grand, which believe it or not, actually puts us way below the average um, in a lot of states. So it People was like- People spend more than 20 I think the average in New York is something like 52. What? Yeah, they're wow. huge. Wow, how is, how is it that expensive? I think the Holy actual crap. average number is 37,000. Wow. That seems like I, I don't know anything about wedding expense. I was thinking more like ten to fifteen grand. Well, if you but, think about it, like most weddings yeah. are like well over a hundred people. So if you just think about like the food, drink, lot, like all of those costs, like it, yeah. it totals up. I, I'm, my answer is like I don't really know, but like mine is like ten to fifteen grand. Yeah. Like, I would think. I don't know. Yeah. I just don't know. Yeah. Hard to say. But the thing is, it really totals up, even if you do have a small wedding, like, you know, out of like the 5,000, for example, that my parents gave for me, like 2,500 of that was just a uh, uh, dinner after. Because we also did a civil wedding in New York uh, with a much smaller group. But like, even just that dinner, it was like $2,500 because it was like, I don't know, 20 people or something. <sighs> you could just go to McDonald's. The dollar well, menu. Have listen. you seen the dollar menu lately? It's looking pretty good right now. I, you know, the thing is, one thing I will say, uh, all things considered, I, there's not a single penny of that experience that I regret, and I highly recommend small, intimate weddings. I think the the degree to which your dollar stretches and you're able, because to be able to spend a week in a house with all of your favorite people that you don't get to see all in the same mm -hmm. place, like that's something I'll take to my grave. So, mm -hmm. for both, what would you do if you won the lottery? What would I do? Um, honestly, depends how much. Let's say the, the like, lotto, like 360 million. 360 million. Um, probably what I would do is just, I'd, I'd probably take 10 of, well, three, wait, wait, how much? 300 million? Let's I just call it like, 300. Let's just say it's 150 after tax. So 150. I'd probably give immediate family, I don't know, 10 million of that and just split it up. And then the rest of it would probably go into, uh, I would say probably commercial real estate or very large apartment buildings that I would just buy with cash, set up uh, a property management system on all of it so it would be as passive as it could be. Um, and then I might just leave a few million left over in cash uh, to cover any expenses. But all of that would be spent pretty immediately on just investing it. So it, I, I, you know, I don't, I feel like that amount is dangerous for people to have all at once. So I feel like totally. I would just want to just invest it as quick as possible and then just live off of whatever that produces. Yeah, I would, um, uh, not to make myself sound like some kind of a martyr, but I would probably do, a lot of that would go to charity. Uh, I would like to start, there are various nonprofits that I would like to start if I had that kind of philanthropic mm. level wealth. Um, definitely do a few nice things for family members, for sure. Uh, 
I would definitely set aside a large amount of it to see my in-laws more frequently, like just a lot more frequent mm. backs and back and forth across the across the ocean, bringing them here and vice versa. Uh, and then as far as like the actual financial strategy, I mean, I would definitely put a lot away in like pretty secure investments so that, you know, my 4% is like substantial to live on. Um, you know, I would set myself up to be financially independent, but in a much more sustained, slow drip way that I'm not like, like you said, you don't want to be overwhelmed with that amount of cash at the same time. And I'd probably, I would probably buy a few properties. Yeah. And for charities too, you can often, by the way, you could invest your money and then with those investment proceeds uh, donate to charity. Yes. I, I, I'm very, I think I'm like very uncomfortable with a lot of money. So I don't, I would, yeah, I would. You could pay it in taxes half. Half would go to taxes. It would, excited? actually. Uh, I don't know how it would work with, uh, you know, that's that's an interesting question. Yeah. Would France take some of it too? Because it would be both my husband and I and, we, you know, I don't know what the Uncle Sam is, Uncle Sam. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, we might even end up taxes owing taxes abroad. Isn't that exciting? Uh, yeah, no, yeah. I mean, listen, when my <laughs> accountant was like, where are we setting up in Delaware? I was like, New York State, baby, where I live. Where oh, Delaware my, sounds so good right now. <laughs> my little neighbor kids go to school and we work on the roads and the firefighters. Okay. <clears throat> oh, this is a good one. I know index funds are a very safe investment, but are they profitable? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Good question. <laughs> what um, if the answer was no? No. They're not no, they're not. Yeah, they're no. a scam. Nope. Ponzi um, scheme. <laughs> Ooh, ultimate favorite books did not have to be finance related. Uh, Think and Grow Rich, How to Win Friends and Influence People. I would say those two books. How to Win Friends and Influence People, I, I think for myself, it's probably the most impactful for me. Also, Awaken the Giant Within by Tony Robbins. And The 4-Hour Workweek, Timothy Ferris. This gets you thinking. Hit, hitting the greats. Um, I will keep mine to the finance slash business side to just like stay consistent with that. Uh, my number one all-time favorite book uh, is a book called Rework uh, by the co-founders of 27 Signals, Ruby on Rails, uh, Basecamp, uh, just like two guys in the tech space who are all about just uh, thinking about work in a different way. They're all about sort of um, a more community-based, uh, like profit sharing, like they're low, they, everyone has a really reasonable work week, like their employees are all you know, super well taken care of. And they just are all about, you know, they, they're they all super anti like hustle porn, anti burnout, anti like growth at all costs. And it just completely shaped the way I think about uh, owning a business. Uh, and they also have a recent book out, the, their new one called It Doesn't Have to Be Crazy at Work, which is also excellent. So DHH and Jason Fried, Freed, they're also constantly going off on Twitter. Uh, very interesting people to follow. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, I'm trying to see which one is like a slightly different angle. Um, what is your, ooh, that's good. What is your biggest financial regret? So thinking of this from like a financial perspective of like overspending on something or like a bad investment, I really haven't done anything that's been, that's been that major because I really haven't spent that much money on much. Um, and I've been pretty safe about where I put my money. I would say, if anything, my only financial regret, and this takes like a completely different approach with this, is that in my early 20s, uh, I would say, well, actually, I would say between like 18 and 23, I didn't go out and do much. And I really, I stayed home for the sake of saving money. And there were a lot of times where friends would be like, hey, come out, you know, come out with us. We're going to be going and like, you know, eating at this place and going over here. And... And I wanted to go, but I was like, ah, I, d I don't want to spend like 50 bucks. And so there were so many times where I didn't go out and I'd just be like, you know, sit at home and, and just or just like work extra. Um, so I regret not going and, and doing those things. And now you feel like you have more of a balance. No, I feel like I have more of a balance. But that back then, it was definitely way too extreme. Um, and looking back now, I mean, that would have made no difference for me to go out, you know, on a weekend and spend even like a hundred dollars on a weekend every now and then, like would have made no difference. Um, so I've definitely loosened up since then. This is a good one. And I'm, I'm actually curious on your feelings on this too. And okay. I just lost the question. Right, Let me pull right. it back up. How important is it to have good relationships with people when it comes to business? I think that's everything. I, I mean, why wouldn't you want to have a good relationship with someone when it comes to business? Um, I, really important. I don't know how to how to answer. I mean, really, like extremely important. Yes. 
I, I would agree. I would only make one caveat. So my, like having healthy, uh, wonderful relationships with my business partners, with my employees, my colleagues, like that is uh, of limitless advantage to me and, and makes life better. One thing I will say though, is that a lot of people conflate uh, business relationships and personal relationships in the sense that uh, you have to still be able to hold people accountable and you have to uh, sometimes separate out your personal feelings from someone with what needs to happen on a business level. And if you don't have that skill, which I still have trouble with and took me a long time to develop, it can be very uh, harmful. For example, you can stay in business relationships that aren't necessarily beneficial to you, or you can stay at a job that isn't healthy for you or not you know, where you could be doing the best for your career because you feel an outside sense of loyalty to an employer or what have you. Like You have to make sure that you're cultivating those good relationships but you're still making sure that the business gets done, that you're taking care of yourself and that you're not um, overly giving yourself to another person and being taken advantage of. Yeah, you answered that way better than I did. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> um, all right. Ooh, what's your outlook on the economy for 2020? I think, you know, so I, I have two things. Number one, I feel like there's, there's so much going on right now with our economy that I think would bode to be a little bit more negative, but the market keeps going up and rates keep going down. Uh, some of that to me is a little bit illogical. Now, does that mean you should time the market? No, because that's not to say that this market won't continue going up for another three to 10 years. Who knows? Uh, but lately I've been a little bit more, I, I don't want to say cautious, but certainly more cautious <laughs> because I feel like, you know, I, I, I'm not concerned that we've gone up for too long and, you know, this can't be sustained. But I think the markets right now are acting a little bit more irrational. And I think lowering interest rates even further seems more like a tactic to, to prop up the markets. Um, but I'm not timing the markets or right. anything like that. I'm continue investing, but I definitely keep enough cash on the side where if the markets go down, uh, I would be able to buy back in at lower prices. And if anything were to happen, I'd you know be okay. And I highly recommend other people do the exact same too. Keep an emergency fund. Don't invest more than you're comfortable with. Uh, if you need the money anytime soon, maybe you shouldn't go all in Tesla. You know, certain things like this that I think anyone can do. Uh, but that's my thought of of the market right now. I mostly agree. I think anyone who claims to know what the market's going to do is a bit of a huckster. Uh, don't listen to anyone who says that they can predict the future. They can't. Um, but that being said, we know that these things are cyclical. We know that generally speaking, around every 10 years, there's going to be a little bit of a lull there. I mean, it's it's pretty much inevitable at some point when, when that point is unclear. Um, but on a personal level, my husband and I are keeping a lot more cash than we usually do because there's a fairly good chance that in the next, you know, maybe two years, there could be an opportunity to buy in at a low price, as he mentioned, uh, on some, you know, investments, perhaps even pick up some property. Uh, but just also, we want to make sure there's a lot of liquidity uh, because, you know, you don't, you never want to be uh, in a position where, you know, a lot of your money's tied up and at a at the point that you need it, not worth a whole lot. So uh, just really keeping our options as open as possible. Um, and so, yeah, I basically just agree with that. Um, but I will say again, like the kinds of steps that you should take to prepare yourself for a bear market are really the kind of steps that you should take in life in general. I Just like a slightly ramped up version of it. I agree. And as my husband often says, worrying is praying for something negative to happen. <laughs> so don't worry about something that you can't control. Just plan and prepare. I agree. Um, Chelsea, would you ever want to live in France permanently? Why or why not? Uh, maybe depending why, because otherwise we don't see my husband's family. They're a lot less mobile than my family. That <laughs> makes them sound like they're all a million years old. Okay. Um, hoo -hoo -hoo. Uh, this one is absolutely adorable. I'm 17 with enough money for a down payment on a home. Is it better to wait until I can pay in full? No. <laughs> um, 17, though, with enough money to put it down, that's pretty impressive. I want to know what, what the 17-year-old is doing. I don't have any more information. Um, but no, I, I would not buy a home in cash. I don't think it makes sense. Uh, if it's a rental property especially, a lot of those mortgage expenses are going to be a complete write-off. Uh, with, with interest rates right now as low as they are, it makes sense 
to almost arbitrage your money. You can get an interest rate right now in the low 3% on a 30-year fixed. Uh, and typically, if you were to invest that somewhere else over the long term, you should be able to make more than that. So to me, it just makes sense to not have all of your money tied up in a property and to instead at least have it on the side and you can go and play with it. And if you ever need to, you can always sell off those investments to pay off the house if you desire. I mean, you're 17 though, so like, I would I would encourage someone to wait at least until they're 18 to like make any decision of that magnitude, don't you think? You think 17 is like you could make a decision to buy a home at 17? I've, you know, it depends, depends what the goal is of that. But I feel like at 17, if you've saved up enough money to do that, I would put more money into whatever you just did to make that money. Like what if, if it was a, a grandparent dying? <laughs> like kill well, the other well, one. Well, <laughs> then I think, well, then, well, if that's the case, you know, hopefully it's not, you know, you know, that, like that. But if, if that's the case and it's an inheritance, then I think real estate of all places would be a fairly safe place to park money. Yeah. You know? That, I think that's probably true. Um, but sure. I would, like, consult with a grown-up. <laughs> How do you know that a house is a good investment? That's such a, a long question to answer. Um, I look at the comparable values in the area and I see what I can get a certain deal for compared with what everything else is selling for. So if you know the market area, is, let's say it's a million dollars, but this house is the equivalent and it's selling for 920, then I know there's 80 grand of equity in that house that, uh, that I have built into that deal. But also if a property makes good cash flow uh, compared to everything else in the area, then I think that's another thing to consider. Um, so for me, I look at those two things, and then I also look at the future appreciation and the potential of the area. <clears throat> I think there are some areas that, that have more upside than others in terms of development, in terms of where people are moving, and I think that's something that you can kind of get ahead of the curve in and just buy in an area right before the development starts up in an area that you see people are kind of moving into. So that helps you on the appreciation on that. Nice. It's my short answer. Yeah, and also, like, I mean, obviously, if it's going to be your primary residence, does this suit your needs to live mm. in? Um, <laughs> where did I just lose it? Oh, uh, what are the best and worst purchases you both have made in the past few years? Uh, best purchases, well, the best purchase ever was the uh, was the Tesla. I mean, oh. that completely catapulted my channel. Um, so if it were not me for me buying the Tesla Model 3, I mean, I wouldn't have had that video. Uh, that video would not have done so well, and I don't know where I would be without that car. Um, so that car was definitely my best purchase, but it was, that was never intended, but uh, that worked out really well. That was, that was a lot of luck involved in that one. Uh, worst purchase, I would say, was that stupid Ryblox cryptocurrency by far. I mean, that was, just, that was very stupid of me to, to have done that. L yeah. We stand an honest man yeah. in this house. Uh, it's really kind of weird to refer to them as purchases, but the best money I've ever spent in the last year was definitely my employees. I have great, I work with fantastic people and I just adore them all and they have made my life so much better and my business so much better and each one has been better than the last. So that's the best money I've spent. I would never refer to them as a purchase, but mm. uh, that's definitely the best money. Worst money I've spent. Um, ooh, uh, I, ooh, I'm just, there's so many is the problem. It's not that I have a hard time thinking of them. It's that I make bad purchases constantly. Um, I would say like, oh, um, definitely about, oh, my, my husband would kill me if I didn't mention this one. So I don't know how I managed to do this, but I bought two bed frames uh, instead of one. <laughs> and even just repackaging that bed frame because my poor husband, so I bought two of them without realizing mm -hmm. I had bought two for our guest room. We moved uh, at the beginning of, or the end of last year. I bought two without realizing it. The two boxes were in the hallway and he thought they were both part of the bed frame. Oh, that's so an honest mistake. He yeah. literally disassembled both packages and it's one of those packages with like a million parts and he like lays them all out and he's doing it. And it took him well into the process to be like, wow. holy shit, this is two bed frames. And um, then he spent several hours reassembling the package and it is still in our hallway. Um, I because it is about a hundred pounds, so it's very difficult to even get it out of the apartment. <laughs> Should sell it. This is the platform. If someone needs an extra bed. Hey, honestly, at this point, if you like... can come pick it up. I live in Manhattan. I'll give you the address when you you know when, when you reach out to me. But if you want a free bed frame, you can come. You pick shouldn't. It up. You shouldn't it's be queen. free. You should. You cool. should charge at least. How much is it worth? Oh my God! It's such not that expensive of a bed frame. How much is it worth? Oh, what is 
say like 180 or something. So the price is $50. Yeah, okay, fine. 50 bucks. Yeah. There you go. I'll take a Starbucks gift card. There we anyway, go. Anyway, that was it. And every time it's still in my hallway and on the occasions that I like get upset at Mark, he just like gestures towards the bed frame <laughs> and he's like, really? Really? Are we complaining about something that I did? Uh, yeah, that was not a good move on my part. Okay, um, let's do one rapid fire, uh, two rapid fires. All right. Um, aw, what is your definition of happiness? Ooh, I would say t- I, I, I freedom. But I would just say to have that freedom. To me, nice. it means happiness. Happiness to me is um, spending time with the people I love, like Mr. Rogers. Call it the freedom. To spend the, the time freedom with to spend time with, with the yeah. people I love. It's freedom that comes with everything. What is one specific major goal that you each plan on accomplishing this year? Okay, mine is to set up a reef aquarium this year. This is my goal. <laughs> That's it. The aquarium. Yeah, it's it's gonna come soon. I think another few months away. What is my goal? Um. Uh, I. God, what is my goal for this year? I don't really have any. Um, you know what? You know what my goal is? To truly take the summer off of making videos. Whoa, but the algorithm, though. I the know. algorithm is not uh, going to like so that. So don't worry, guys. We're going to have content for you all year, but we're like getting way ahead of schedule. We have a few more things planned for the channel that will just free me up personally to spend two months, July and August, without filming any videos, which would be the first time that I've ever gone more than like a week without filming a video in four years. So... That is my number one goal. It will take a while to get there, especially because one of my colleagues is going on maternity leave at that time. But I'm going to use that as further motivation to sync up that timeline, get way ahead of schedule, and take July and August off the camera. So you're still going to have content posted, yes. but it's just for two months. You're not going to... Yeah. Okay, we, we got have, it. Okay. I'm either going to film ahead of time or we have other people who make guest content for us. But we will have content for you. Do not worry. It's just I don't want to be physically filming videos for that two-month period. Fair. That's a goal. Cool. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Graham. Thank for you. Being I really here. appreciate a it. A pleasure and a joy. Where can yeah. people go to find more of you? YouTube.com slash C slash Graham Stefan. The or just, C? Yeah, it's YouTube.com slash C. It's the oh. channel. Oh. Or you just search Graham Stefan. Yeah. Or <laughs> Down just like below in the description. Google yeah. Tesla stock, and I'm sure his video will appear high up. I wonder there. if it ranks. It could it could it's, be ranked. I bet it right ranks. Now. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you guys cool. for tuning in as always, and we will see you next Monday. Now, Graham loves to buy houses. That's no secret. But I bet you that when he goes to buy a house, he has a very clear picture of his full financial situation. And if you are someone who has been wanting to learn a lot more details and nuance about where you stand financially, you should check out Turbo. Turbo is a totally free app that basically gives you a bird's eye view of all the various indicators of your financial health, things like your credit worthiness, your net worth, your debt to income ratio, your credit utilization ratio, your credit score, and all of the information to get you to a place where you are are super financially healthy and are going to be approved for things like, for example, a great mortgage, a great loan. You want to go into these big decisions, possible meetings with lenders and banks, knowing everything you can and getting your finances to the best place they can be so that you are a good candidate for something like a loan. And so you'll want the tool that will give you that picture and give you the understanding you need to improve all of those indicators and put your money in the right place before you go make those decisions. I highly recommend you check out Turbo at the link in our description or the show notes. And remember, it is totally free.